also in the context of our ongoing inquiry concerning how Parliament and select committees in particular can promote better strategic thinking in government. And so in this session, we are starting with uh, a post-budget um, section on the economy and public services. We're moving on to global issues and, um, and then concluding with a few questions about um, scrutiny of strategic thinking in government. So with that, we will start straight away. Harriet Baldwin, Treasury Select Committee. Thank you, Sir Bradley. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. And uh, I think probably the best way to start in that context is just to say, how is the economic strategy going? Sorry, thank you, uh, Sir Bernard, for the preamble. And uh, Harriet, well, when I first got this job, I set out five priorities. Three of them were economic, to halve inflation, grow the economy, and reduce debt. And I'm pleased to say we've made progress on all three, uh, particularly on inflation, which was the number one economic objective, uh, to bring it down from the record highs that we've seen at 11 per cent. Obviously, the last set of numbers, at just under 3.5 per cent, were very encouraging. And in terms of the economy, obviously, we'd all like to see the economy growing faster, but it is worth saying uh, it defied the sceptics last year, significantly outperformed expectations and did in fact grow and all the signs from early this year are that it has uh, returned to growth, as we saw in the latest, latest GDP figures. And then obviously we are on track to meet our fiscal rules to ensure that debt is falling. Uh, so those are the three main priorities that are set out, progress on all three, we've got to stick to the plan and I'm happy to expand in detail as you'd like. Well, thank you. I mean, debt obviously has gone up massively over the course of this parliament. This has been a parliament where there's been a record amount of public spending. There's been a pandemic. There's been this uh, energy price uh, crisis. Um, but on that third uh, economic priority in terms of, of debt, um, the Office for Budget Responsibility actually says that this year um, it's just below 89% of our economy. And it's actually rising every year for uh, the next few years, and then forecast to slightly dip in the fifth year. And I just wonder uh, how you feel about that, Prime Minister, given how important it is um, having uh, debt under control for the strategic priorities of, of government. Yeah, I think it's, it's very important that we have debt under control because that financial security is not just important for the country, it's important for the future of our public services. And I think everyone knows the context of the last few years, obviously a pandemic, which rightly necessitated the government to step in, support the NHS, the vaccine rollout, furlough, public services more generally, uh, but then also the energy crisis, which again, rightly required the government to step in and support households with energy bills. Both of those uh, occurrences, once in a generation, once in a century, necessitated an increase in public debt. But I am pleased that we are meeting our fiscal rules, both of them as the OBR, have uh, verified. And I think every time the Chancellor has stood up uh, since I got this job, the overall debt profile has improved in terms of the percentage of GDP. Headline debt is forecast to fall from next year. Uh, and we've always said on a medium term trajectory, we'd have uh, debt falling, which the rule sets out. The OBR have confirmed that we are meeting it. Uh, but that requires constant discipline on public spending and spending decisions, as you know. But, but you confirm that debt is still rising and uh, rising for the next uh, several years. And, and, and under no scenario that I've seen from anyone um, is it ever forecast to return to what it was before the pandemic. Do you think there's any hope that for future taxpayers that debt could ever reach those kinds of levels again? Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to believe so, yes. Um, now, we, our fiscal rules are always very clear from the outset about the trajectory that we would have debt falling under. Actually, headline debt, I think, uh, starts to fall from next year um, rather than several years. Uh, but, you know, that was the right thing to do given at the time that I came into office it was necessary to support the economy in, in the short term uh, and then make sure that medium term there is, uh, as I said, fiscal strength, uh, which is what the rules confirm that we are delivering and, and over time there's no reason for it not to continue falling as long as we have strong control over public spending you know that will allow us to at the same time as growing the economy that will allow us to continue reducing debt as a share of GDP over the medium term. 
Well, well just, just to put it on the record, the OBR has the debt rising from just under 89% this year to 93.2% in 2028. Um, and I just wondered if I could slightly change the subject to the, as you mentioned, recent budgets. Uh, when we had the Chancellor in front of our committee, he accepted and was disappointed that on the morning of the budget, uh, one of the main items in the budget, the cut to national insurance, was in fact leaked to the national papers. And I wondered if um, you knew how that had happened and if there's a leak inquiry underway. Um, yes, just look, on, on, on debt, I'd say headline debt was forecast to be 100% of GDP by 27, 28, when I first got into this job. And it's now forecast to be around five percentage points lower than that. Just goes to the point that on every event that we've had, the, the profile has in, improved. Um, now, on, you know, I deplore these leaks, particularly around budget measures. I suffered from them as Chancellor myself. Uh, I, I can't recall the specific situation around that leak inquiry, but in general, the leak inquiries are instituted uh, when there has been a breach of the confidentiality that we expect, particularly around a budget process with the market sensitivity of those measures. So there's, there's been a leak inquiry about the leak of the budget this time then? Uh, I, I, I can't recall specifically on that, that measure. I'll happily write back to the committee. In general, leak inquiries are instituted uh, when there is a leak of sensitive information. Obviously, it has historically proved difficult to identify the culprits um, of those, but it's in no one's interest uh, other, well, uh, it's certainly not in the government's interest uh, to have sensitive budget measures leaked in advance. But they must be kept on a very tight, uh, they are, need to uh, know uh, basis. Uh, they are, uh, typically, uh, they are kept on a very tight basis, and there is strong information security in the Treasury, which I, I know well myself. Uh, that tends to become tougher right at the end of a process where obviously the, the net widens towards the end as all the materials start to be published and booklets printed and all the rest of it. Um, but in general, there is very strong information security, so it's disappointing to see. I look forward and, to and seeing... And name, named lists, as you alluded to. I look, I look forward to seeing the letter. Thank you, Sir yeah. Bernard. Thank yeah. you. Um, Steve Bryan, Health and Social Care. Prime Minister, the NHS long-term workforce plan has a productivity increase per annum between 1.5 and 2%. The budget committed the NHS to 1.9%, so top end, a year over the second half of this decade. And you've put £3.4 billion behind that, which I'm sure is, I know is, badly needed. The Chancellor said, that, quotes, there are parts of the NHS that are woefully inefficient. Which parts, and how confident are you, this will move the dial and move it fast, as it's clearly needed? Yeah. Um, I think the first thing to say is it's not the government's productivity plan, it's the NHS's own productivity plan. And uh, so that's a starting point. It has been backed in full with £3.4 billion of largely capital investment. And, now the, and it will unlock cumulatively tens of billions of pounds of saving over the, the forecast period. I think that the most fertile areas that the NHS have identified uh, are to do with the greater use of digital technology. Um, about 13 million hours, they estimate, is lost by doctors and nurses every year due to outdated IT systems. To give you some examples, there are theatre processes, which if those can be digitised more effectively, will allow the same number of consultants to do around 200,000 more operations a year. Um, similarly, there's technology that will allow doctors to help read MRI and CAT scans more accurately, which will mean that about 130,000 patients extra would, uh, would get their results quicker. And then the NHS app um, can be improved to allow confirmation modification of all appointments. And they estimate that that will reduce around half a million missed appointments annually, um, which obviously creates essentially free capacity uh, for the NHS. So those are some of the areas um, that they've identified. Uh, probably another one is the NHS staff app as well, which will allow more efficient rostering electronically and reduce um, off framework agency spend, which uh, you'll be uh, familiar with. Uh, and uh, the NHS are planning in general to set out more details later this year. The workforce plan is without question one of the most significant <coughs> interventions in healthcare planning for, for a generation. You would accept that getting this productivity challenge right with the things you've just set out is make or break for that workforce plan. Yeah, I think that the two things come together uh, because the workforce plan itself has a reform element, which is a slightly distinct 
to the overall NHS workforce, probably NHS productivity plan. There are three elements of the workforce plan, train, retain and reform. Yep. So obviously it's to significantly increase the number of doctors, nurses, dentists and other healthcare professionals that we train and that expansion has already started. That's never been done before uh, on this scale. Retain to improve retention of staff. And then the third area is reform uh, with the use of new types of roles, for example, in, uh, example physician associates, nurse associates, um, new use of apprenticeships and ensuring that every medical professional can practice at what's called the top of their license. Those types of things will unlock labour productivity slightly distinct to the productivity plan. Thank you. And just finally from me, the federated data <coughs> platform, should that be extended across primary care? Because achieving that productivity needs to make sure that pharmacy, general practice, secondary care all connects up and the IT platforms of connecting them up is critical to achieving that productivity. Should the FDP be extended to primary care? So it, it probably wouldn't be right for me to comment on individual suppliers. Uh, I'm relatively conscious that FDP is a, a relative supplier, but in, in general, yes, we should be rolling out productivity enhancing technology across the NHS at both secondary and primary care. Uh, we have seen in secondary care very strong benefits from using FDP. I think the um, uh, Chelsea and Westminster was one of the first trusts that had used it and uh, that was published by the NHS, the uh, improvement in productivity um, from the use, which is why it has, I believe, been authorised to be rolled out more broadly. And in primary care, what we are doing currently is investing in digital telephony to ensure that we can eliminate the engaged tone that people often get at 8am on a Monday uh, and, and then over time improving the software of how to handle calls uh, which again will improve the patient experience uh, but where there are further opportunities to use technology to improve both patient care and uh, the, the, the nature of the work for people involved in primary care of course of course we should be doing that and as I said the 3.4 billion a large amount of that will go on in improving technology to the benefit of staff and patients. Excellent. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Clive Betts for Leveling Up Committee. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, since you were local government minister, Prime Minister, things have got worse for councils, haven't they, in terms of their finances. In the last eight years, uh, uh, sorry, six years, eight councils have effectively declared bankruptcy. In the previous 16 years, none had. So what is the fundamental problem and before we say all those councils have made mistakes, some of them have, but as John Fuller, the uh, Conservative leader, of, um, said to the uh, Select Committee recently, uh, while the, the problems uh, have been specific to some councils, there's now a more general problem, and in the next year or two, about half the authorities will be in financial distress, potentially. Isn't that a fundamental crisis in local government finance? Well, I think that the first thing to say is councils are the backbone of their communities and they carry out tremendous work every day delivering important services to the people they serve and yeah I, I got to experience that as local government minister also being scrutinized by you Clive at, at the time and uh, as we discussed then recognized that they face challenges uh, but that's why particularly over this parliament significantly more funding has gone into local government and most recently 600 million pounds boost in the local, uh, the recent, most recent local government finance settlement, which has meant that councils on average will have around 7.5% more spending power this forthcoming year than they did last year. Um, and that settlement, I think, was, was warmly welcomed by local government association, county councils network, and indeed the district council network. That's in the context, isn't it, of a 30% cut in spending power in the last 14 years. And again, as uh, Councillor Fuller, a, a Conservative leader, said to us, uh, quoting the figures uh, that he's experiencing, when you've got adult social care spending going up by 90%, children with complex needs going up by 23%, and your uh, spending power is going up by 3 to 5%, it does not take a mass genius to work out that there's going to be a gap at some stage, and that gap, according to the LGA now, is around £4 billion, even after the extra money in the budget. The IFS says it's about £7 billion. That's a crisis, isn't it, where you're seeing social care going up, demands children's care going up in particular, 
send uh, special education needs going up and other services being decimated in many parts of the country? No, I, I wouldn't characterise it that way. Of course there are challenges, particularly with inflation, which is why actually to, to Harriet's first question, the overriding economic priority of the government was to bring inflation down because that will help local councils with their finances too, as well as helping families up and down the country. And if you look at what's happened from central government to local government over this parliament since 2019, the grant in cash terms has more than doubled. Right, so that's, that's the change, that over, the, over this parliament, the amount of direct cash grant going from central to local government has doubled in cash terms from 2019 uh, to the... What, why is the Local Government Association then saying uh, that 20% of councils face the threat of bankruptcy in the next two years? Uh, uh, why are they saying that? Uh, it, uh, of course, every council is going to be different and face challenges, but I can just but tell 20% you that centre, centre, it, central so. government has doubled the grant since 2019, since I was Chief Secretary, uh, the grant going from central to local government has doubled over this parliament. Core spending power has gone up, uh, as I said, meaningfully over the last four or five years as well. Of course, there are always going to be challenges, but you know, where government can step in to help alleviate some of that pressure, it has done, particularly with social but care, perhaps looking which has forward, been the major area of concern. You've got these concerns rest right across local government by Conservative councils as well as Labour, right across. In the spending plans looking forward to the next parliament, the forecast is that de levelling up the department, including local government, is not a protected department. So there's a forecast of no growth in spending whatsoever. Is it really sustainable that local councils could face no increase in support from government at all for four years and not make increased cuts to their services, which already are at rock bottom, or put council tax up by excessive amounts? What is going to give, Prime Minister? Well, I, I don't think we're going to write the next spending review here and now. But, um, but it's, so in, it's as, in the forecast. Uh, again, the next spending review hasn't been done, so people, are, people can forecast all they want until the spending review is actually done. But there I thought you had a plan to, to comment on. What I can tell you, and actually as the chair opened with, overall public spending is forecast to grow in real terms over the next spending review period, in cash terms by something like 25 2.7% uh, annually. And, uh, and uh, as I said, that hasn't been divvied up into various departments. That is what spending reviews are for. And necessarily, governments will prioritise at that moment. But overall public spending is forecast to rise, not just in cash terms, but in real terms over the next parliament. But, but, but the that's what the plans that are in the OBR's current forecast contain for day-to-day -day spending. But, but in those forecasts, Prime Minister, DLUC is not a protected department. Therefore, it is forecast to have no increase at all in its spending for the next parliament. That's the current forecast, isn't it? Uh, that, 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 I mean, all I can say is the spending review has not been done. The only number that exists is an overall spending envelope for what's called RDEL, the day-to-day government spending on public services. As I said, that's forecast to grow just over 2.5% in cash terms, 1% in real terms uh, over the forecast period. Now, how that is divvied up between different departments is the work of a spending review. Now, I, as we, I always come here and we have these debates. It's completely reasonable for everyone to say in their individual areas they would like more money to be spent on their particular interests, and I'm sure we'll hear, hear that from many colleagues, as the chair pointed out at the beginning. But I think it's just incumbent on colleagues to explain which department they think that increase should come at the expense of, or indeed what taxes should be raised to pay for it. I mean, look, government is in the business of always having to prioritise, but the, the framework that we've set out is one where public spending continues to grow in real terms over the next parliament. The next spending review will divvy that up amongst the competing priorities, and the track record over this parliament is for a substantial increase going into local government, particularly in the area of social care, where the most pressure has been. Robin Walker, Education. Thank you, Prime Minister. Just to follow up on the question, you mentioned the area of social care, and obviously there was some small amount of extra funding <coughs> in the recent budget um, for that area, but many local authorities have a deficit in high, high needs budget in uh, their social, children's social care budget and in home to school transport. Is there anything you can do in your coordinating role across government to make sure that the, the support to them from different government departments is better coordinated? And can we make sure that we invest in addressing those deficits rather than in programmes to run them, like safety valve and delivering better value, which seem to be getting larger and larger uh, over the years, but without actually reducing uh, or removing those deficits? Yeah. 
I think that the, the, the first thing to say is I think we want all children, young people of school age to receive a great education and regardless of their backgrounds and circumstances we want that to be the case and that's why over the course of this parliament the high needs budget has seen increases of around 60% since 2019. Recognising, as you rightly point out, some of the pressures we've seen and the growth mm. in um, uh, EHCP plans over that period and today's announcement is part of an almost two and a half billion pound capital programme to create more places and um, uh, which uh, I think has been is warmly warmly received today. Uh, you're right about the, the cross-cutting nature of it, which I'm sure we'll talk about it in the final session on, on strategy. Isn't always easy for for government to get precisely right. I saw that as local government minister, but coordinating closely with DFE colleagues when it came uh, to SEND or children's social care. So I, I think what what we need to do is make sure that those ministers are joined up, that when it comes to spending reviews, and I've seen this as local government minister, chief secretary, chancellor, and now as prime minister, that we make sure at the moment of the spending review, the relevant de departments on areas which have cross-cutting equities are properly coordinated mm -hmm. um, so that things don't fall between the gaps. And then uh, maybe the, the last thing I'd just pick up on is we are investing, because you've touched on it, um, and I appreciate that the safety valve schemes are for the immediate relief and they can help, but we are investing £70 million in the change programme which launched uh, in the autumn of last year, um, which is, there's nine different partnerships, covers about 30 different local areas, and I do think it's important that we test those interventions at that level before rolling them out on a system-wide basis. Um, I, look, people might have debates about the pace, but given the importance of getting the reforms right to alleviate the longer-term pressure, um, it's right that we as a trial those first it, in those areas. And I, I recognise the importance of testing. Um, I think particularly in terms of two areas, kinship care and send placements, you know, there is urgent need to support people who, who, who are providing really valuable support and keeping people out of the care system. Yeah. Uh, and so I think if we're going to meet our aspirations of the right support at the right place, right time, we need to make sure that we can grow um, the, the, the support that's there to address the demand in HCPs. If I can just ch change the subject to financial education, you've championed mm. math skills and numeracy as Prime Minister, are, are, we've received a lot of support for our inquiry into financial education. How do you strike the right balance between taking the opportunity of maths to 18 um, for as many pupils as possible, including those who may not be terribly good at complex mathematics, um, and, and making sure that they are equipped with the financial education they need to thrive in the modern world? Yeah, well, I'm grateful for the committee for looking into this obviously it's subject dear to my heart. And, and I don't think those two things are actually in opposition and, and part of broadening maths education is to ensure that everyone has a good understanding of maths because we know from all the evidence, all the research, that it's hugely important for future earnings potential, employment potential, ability to participate in many aspects of everyday life. And sadly, um, we haven't done a good enough job at it in the past and one in four children leave formal education without basic numeracy and we have some of the highest levels of adult innumeracy um, in the Western world. The reforms that we've announced uh, will help, uh, particularly for the most disadvantaged. One, because over time there'll be more teaching time in the classroom. Uh, compared to our peers, we don't have enough. Uh, that will disproportionately benefit disadvantaged children. Uh, secondly, we've created a £30,000 bonus for teachers that are going to teach STEM professions over the first five years of their career, also including maths. But for the first ever time, that will apply to people teaching in FE colleges, not just schools. That's a change that I was mm. keen to make to broaden the benefit um, of that intervention. And then lastly, uh, same announcement, we announced new funding, hundreds of millions of pounds, to help students successfully resit maths and English GCSEs. And again, that disproportionately benefits uh, those disadvantaged students. So I think those interventions, as I said, will disproportionately help disadvantaged students. And, you know, maths to 18 is not about everyone doing maths A level or further maths. It's people having oh. a decent degree of familiarity with mathematical concepts. Uh, but just, just, just briefly, I mean, you also commended and welcomed personally the, the department's move to strengthen the ban on mobile phones in classrooms. Mm. Um, we've heard a lot of evidence during our screen time inquiry about the broader risks to children from uh, too much exposure to screen time for social 
social media, the mental health pressures uh, that they're facing as a result of that. Beyond the Online Safety Act, do you think there's more that we can do to protect children in this space? Uh, and do you think we ought to be doing more to support parents in knowing how to protect yes. children? Uh, well, as a parent of two uh, girls at mobile phone age, or just uh, they're near there or thereabouts, uh, there's something I think about a lot. I've been struck by how many teachers and parents spoke, speak to me when I'm around the country about the particular issue at schools, and I'm glad that our new guidance has been warmly welcomed by, uh, I think, lots of different people, because it really will help schools navigate that and ensure that the default is for, you know, for children not to be able to have access to their phones during the, the school day. Uh, the Online Safety Act, before we kind of move beyond it, I think it is important that we do implement it, right? It is world-leading legislation. It's, it's not, um, this stuff is not easy, and what we need now is a regulator to get on and implement all the things in there, because they will make a significant difference to protecting children from harmful or inappropriate content um, and activity online, whether that's bullying, pornography, promotion of self-harm. You know, we took a lot of time collectively across the house and getting that legislation right, and implementing it now ought to be the, the priority. Now, look, alongside that, of course, I'm, I'm thinking more broadly about this question. I think schools were the most immediate area to focus on. The Online Safety Act is important. You know, more broadly, uh, this is something I think about. As I said, first and foremost, as a parent, I'm open. People have made suggestions. I recently uh, had the privilege and pleasure of speaking to Molly Russell and um, uh, uh, Brownie Guy's mother uh, about some of these issues as well, and I've been reflecting on the conversation that I had with them too. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, now, Stephen Crabb, the Chair of the Welsh Affairs Committee. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. My committee has recently met with some of the 600,000 under 35-year-olds who are currently inactive due to long-term sickness, often with a mental health need. Despite them telling us very articulately how motivated they were in wanting to work, none of them are receiving uh, medical interventions to help them get better. Um, they're not subject to any employment intervention. There's no real requirement or expectation that they should ever work again. Um, do you agree, Prime Minister, that's an appalling indictment of both our health and our welfare systems? I think, look, I, I think it's a, it's a tragedy for those people um, because work, I believe, can actually provide an enormous amount of purpose and fulfilment to people's lives. And everyone who can work, I believe, should work not just because that's fair to everybody else and helps financial sustainability and gives them financial security, but actually because it can bring that purpose and, uh, and dignity to, to people's lives. And so where, where we can provide support to people into work, we should. You are right to highlight, and that's been one of the um, you know, unfortunate consequences of the pandemic is the rise in economic inactivity, particularly for those who are long-term sick and concentrated, you know, yes, at the older end, but also, as you rightly highlighted, Stephen, at the younger end. Uh, we are, I'd say, doing a bunch of things. In the last two fiscal events, billions of pounds have been announced, combination of the Chancellor and the Work and Pension Secretary's Back to Work plan, talking therapies, universal support. I could um, go into that in a bit more detail. Uh, uh, but, uh, but as I said, we need to make progress on it, because you're right, right, we need to support everyone who wants to do to work. Forgive me for cutting across, yeah. but just in, in pure fiscal terms as well, would you agree that it's unaffordable, the trajectory oh. of spending, particularly on younger people yes. of working age due to sickness? Yes, uh, the, this, the welfare system needs to be sustainable. So it, it's important that we look at this. And I've spoken about this previously. If you, could, we have a WCA, which you'll be very familiar with from your time. Uh, you know, it's something that we haven't looked at in a decade. And over that period, three times as many people are being signed off as unfit to work than they were a decade ago. I think most people intuitively would think that the country is not three times sicker than it was a decade ago. So that is suggestive of a system that isn't working as intended. You rightly highlighted that actually a significant chunk of those people want to work. Um, so that's why we are reforming <coughs> WCA. Uh, we are giving people support, things like talking therapies for, for mental health. And we are also making sure that the system is fair in the sense of how we use something called the administrative earnings threshold, the expectations that we put on people who can work to work, because that's an important part of making sure the system is fair and ensuring long-term financial sustainability. Thank you. And in terms of another area of welfare spending, is it your assumption that the triple lock should be in place for the entire period of the next parliament? 
I think the Chancellor talked about this uh, at the weekend. I don't have anything further to add to, to what he said. Um, but I think. You talk about it being a manifesto commitment. Yes, and that. But that, that doesn't necessarily apply for the whole of the next Parliament. What's I mean, your position on that? I mean, I, I, think, I, think, I think you can safely assume that that is what he, he, he meant without wanting to write the entire manifesto uh, now. Okay, and so the, if, if that's your position, do you genuinely think that's affordable? Yeah, How I do. Because the, you think the triple lock because the, I, I, I do because the track record of yeah. the government is that we make priorities and making sure that if you've worked hard all your life, you have the dignity that you deserve in retirement is important to me, it's important to the government, and the triple lock is an expression of that. And so I'm actually proud that as a result of the triple lock, pensioners are much less likely to be in poverty. Uh, they will see an almost £900 increase in just a couple of weeks in the state pension, and that comes on the top of significant support over the winter to help with energy bills, a doubling of the winter fuel payment. And it speaks to the kind of country that we believe in and society that we live in, and making sure we look after people at that stage of their lives, I think is the right thing to do. And the triple lock is what this government, in, well, previous Conservative government introduced and we've protected and will continue to do so. Thank you for that. I mean, g given the projected profile of spending on three things, state pension, working age benefit, and the NHS over the next five years. Do, do you think there's something in what Paul Johnson from the IFS said about there being a conspiracy of silence between the two main parties front benches about just how constrained the public finance is going to be over the, you know, the I, next I, forecast period? I don't, look, we're very, I can't speak for uh, other parties, I can speak for the Conservative Party and the government, we've set out plans that continue to have public spending growing in real terms, as I outlined earlier, uh, and then it's the work of future spending reviews to, to divvy that up. Uh, and I do think it's right that we focus on productivity to get more out of the investment we're putting into public services. To, to give just one statistic, public sector productivity is around 5% lower today than it was before the pandemic. Right, 5% lower. And so no one is asking anything heroic. It's just returned to where we were. Obviously, the private sector has managed that. Um, so just return to where we were is worth £20 billion a year. And that is a figure that is also something that the, I never forget the, the person's title, the Comptroller Auditor General, has also suggested there are billions and billions of pounds of productivity to get. We've talked about the NHS previously. But more generally, that's the overall public sector. It's 5% less productive than it was in 2019. That's worth £20 billion a year. My focus is, yes, we're going to grow public spending. But we've got to focus on getting more out of the money that we put in so that we can responsibly cut people's taxes because I think that's, the, again, the right thing to do. We talked about the type of country I believe in. You know, I believe in working hard and having that hard work rewarded. So cutting national insurance by uh, the four points that we've done, £900 tax cut. We want to go further. That requires strong control over public spending, including welfare, getting productivity so that we can continue to keep cut people, cutting people's taxes. Thank you, Prentice. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move to Sir Bob Neill, uh, the Justice Committee. Thank you, Prime Minister. Would you agree with the proposition that an efficient and effective justice system is fundamental to a civilised society? Uh, yes. And that depends, of course, upon it being properly funded, doesn't it? Of course. We're in a situation at the moment where we have uh, record levels uh, of delays in our criminal courts, particularly in the Crown Courts, and record uh, numbers of people in prison to the extent that the Justice Secretary, Admiral the Minister, is having to take emergency measures to manage them. The two are clearly linked, aren't they? What's uh, being done to block that, to unblock that? So, uh, I think it's worth remembering the, the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic. And we made a decision during the pandemic to protect jury trials, which I know is something that the committee and you and others, in fact, everyone was supportive of. Now, obviously, during a pandemic, that flow of justice slowed, inevitably. And what that has meant is that there has been something like a 50% increase, even though know, the number's better than me, uh, in the remand population of people awaiting trial or sentencing. And, and that actually accounts for the biggest increase in the prison population yeah. over that time. And so I think it is, it's reasonable to have said, well, we should not have persevered with jury trials, and that was a mistake, and I said that at the time if someone did. I don't believe anyone did, actually. Everyone thought it was the right thing to do, and it's unsurprising, therefore, that you've had this increase in the population. At the same time, though, we're in the, in the process of the largest 
prison building program, I think since the, since the Victorian age, something that I signed off as chancellor, when they're in the process of building thousands more prison places, um, and, and that is happening at the same time. So we are investing in expanding prison capacity. Uh, that was signed off, as I said, some time ago, and it's being delivered. But there is this particular issue of what COVID did to the remand population in prisons, which is causing the shorter term operational pressure that we're seeing. The problem is, Prime Minister, that in fact, the uh, backlog has not re returned to pre-COVID levels. And when the Lady Chief Justice gave evidence to our select committee earlier this year, she said it would not be possible to achieve the government's target of reducing the backlog to 53,000 cases per annum without radical change. It can't be done on the system as it stands. Isn't the problem that because the Ministry of Justice is an unprotected department, it is picking up people coming into the system because of failures in education, failures in healthcare, in mental health, in drug treatment, and in children's services, for example. All of those account for a large number of entrants into the system. But it's not protected. What's being done to take a joined up approach uh, to funding these issues rather than letting all fall upon a downstream unprotected mm -hmm. department? Well, first thing to say is we're absolutely committed to reducing the outstanding caseload in the Crown Court. And I, I met with the Lady Chief Justice to discuss this on, on a couple of different occasions. And we're working closely with her and the judiciary and other criminal justice partners to speed up justice and improve the experience of court cases. A, a, um, a few specific things I could I'd point to. One is that we funded over, uh, I think, 100,000 sitting days this financial year and again next financial year. We've committed, uh, as I think you'll be familiar with, to keep the use of the 20 Nightingale courtrooms um, which have, in the next financial year, which have made a difference, and we're in the process of recruiting the 1,000 extra judges. And all of that is on track and is helping to ease the pressures. I completely accept, of course, there are pressures. Of course, the backlog as a result of COVID is, is higher than it was, uh, but we're doing what we can to, to bring it down. There's about a hundred, according to the Lady Chief Justice, about a hundred <coughs> unplanned courtroom closures every week uh, because of poor maintenance in the Crown Courts. And there are about 600 on average cells unusable at any, uh, during the course of the average year because of maintenance backlogs in the prisons. Isn't it time that we looked again at the way maintenance contracts are procured uh, for uh, these parts of the justice system? Uh, they seem to be rigid, inflexible and very slow to actually get the work done. Isn't that something that the government needs to be again, looking at uh, in a joined up fashion? Ah, I, 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 I'm less familiar with the exact contracting arrangements. I'm actually uh, happy to get some more information uh, from you, Bob, on, on that. I, I do recall that we had put more money into prison, uh, sorry, to courtroom maintenance with the new Lord Chancellor was something that yeah, he raised with me, as did the... Uh, previous Lord Chief Justice and the Lady Chief Justice, and I think that was signed off some time ago. So there is extra funding going in to court maintenance. Um, but was your precise concern about how that's being spent and the contracting, which I'm not... It's the contract familiar. frameworks uh, are, un are it's suggested to us by experts in the field, uh, out of date rather, very clunky if I can use that word. And despite the best endeavours of the Justice Secretary, the money takes a long time actually to get spent. And that then has a knock-on in the cost of the delays in the system. OK. Uh, well, I'll happily take that away and discuss yeah. that with the Justice Secretary. Because obviously if we're spending the money, we want it to be yeah. spent quickly spent, and well. Spent, and well. Spent, yes. spent, spent. The uh, final point I was going to raise, if I may, Chairman, is on a separate aspect. It's the importance of a functioning civil justice system to businesses. Uh, were you aware that at the moment uh, a small business, which may have, say, a £95,000 money claim, very important to its cash flow, can be waiting up to 70 plus weeks uh, for that case to be resolved if it goes to trial. That's 17 weeks more than it was about four or five uh, years ago. That can't be good for the British economy, can it, that level of delay? Yes, I'm not, I'm not familiar with those statistics for that particular type. I'm very, again, very happy to, to look into it, but more generally, I don't disagree with you that there is an economic benefit to having smooth and swift justice system. If, if I put the point to you that part of the cause of that uh, is because the county courts, which handle 95% of civil work, um, uh, are operating an entirely paper-based system, which causes massive delays. Would you perhaps 
take away the proposition that considerable savings and economic benefit could be uh, achieved for some capital investment uh, in improving the technology and support systems in the okay. civil uh, I will happily do that. Bob, we had invested money in the digital transformation mm. in courts, which I remember signing off on it. Did yeah. that not apply to the, the civil court? Was that only on not the... Not in the county court. Not in the county court. Okay, because we have been doing that and it has been... Yeah. The last time I checked with Alex, it's been one working of the concerns, quite well. Yeah. I understand, Fred. It's the concern that many have is that we rightly think about justice in terms of crime, because that gets the headlines. Fine, I will make but sure we need I more attention to that given as well. to those other bread and butter issues as well. Fine. Prime Minister, we're always very grateful when you follow up uh, with your letter uh, on the topics you haven't been able to cover in detail. And thank you, Sir Bob. Um, Dame Diana Johnson for the Home Affairs Select Committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, on your pledge to stop the boat, you told me last time that considerable progress had been made, so I'm sure you'll be disappointed by the figures for the first three months of this year. There's a 10% increase compared to 22 and 23. But what I want to ask you about is the safety of Rwanda Bill, which obviously uh, I think we're all clear is going to get royal assent fairly soon, and you can then start to put people onto planes and send them to Rwanda. So have you now got an airline that will be able to send people to Rwanda, or are you going to use the RAF? Uh, the, the Home Office are making all the appropriate arrangements. There's a range of options that they're considering. I, d I wouldn't expect me to get into the detail of those because they may well involve, as you would expect, a commercial uh, well, we know conversation. It's costing eleven thousand pounds per but I, well, I can individual. Say is the preparations are all being made and have been made for a while to operationalise okay. the bill. So you're not able to say if there's an airline or not. I, so I wouldn't expect me to get okay. into commercial conversations. But all okay. the prepar preparatory work to operationalise okay. the bill has been in place for a while. Okay. So over thirty-three thousand people have arrived in the UK irregularly since the Illegal Migration Act came into force last July. So are you expecting to send all 33,000 people to Rwanda? Because obviously they can't make a claim for asylum in this country. Yes, well, as you know, the bill has to get royal assent and then subsequent to that, yes, the bill has yeah. to be put in force. And there'll be choices about which cohorts to uh, okay. initially apply the, um, uh, the policy to. There's a range of different options for that. That's all in the planning work but that's being done. So there's 33,000 so, yeah, in limbo. So I just want to be clear, are you expecting that group will go to Rwanda? I said we, we've been, my general view, I probably wouldn't characterise it as being in limbo, is anyone who arrives here illegally should not be able to stay. That well, is the government's and my very clear position and we will do everything that we can to okay. remove them, either to their home country, if it's safe to do so, or a safe alternative so like Rwanda. But my, my, uh, so there's no limbo about it. Is well, our intention is that everybody who arrives here illegally should be removed. Well, they are in limbo at the moment because they can't claim asylum. And you're, you're not able to tell me how many of the 33,000 you think will go to Rwanda. So um, my understanding of 33... Well, because the, I, the IMA needs to be commenced for it to be enforced. Well, but they are still under the... They still come under the rules of the NABA, which also no, made the point. No, these come under the rule of the Immigration uh, Illegal Migration Act from the ena uh, enactment in July. So these are 33,000 people who are in limbo. They can't claim asylum. They are waiting, I assume, to be sent to Rwanda. But I, I want to move on because I've got a couple of other questions. Could you just explain why Number 10 blocked the reappointment of the independent inspector Inspector of Borders and Immigration? Uh, I don't believe that is the case. I think the Home Secretary had, uh, addressed this in the House, in, uh, or either he or one of his ministers addressed this in detail in the House, and uh, the report decision was made by the Home Secretary. So Office. number 10 wasn't involved. Okay. I mean, it, it seems to some people that David Neal was actually a whistleblower, wasn't he? That he, he took the action he did because 15 of his reports were in the Home Office, never seeing the light of day. No, and I think the response to all those, I think he welcomed actually when he gave evidence, maybe to your committee, I think he welcomed the response to those reports having been published and, uh, and I think the remaining two are imminently to be, are. to be published. Um, they are, yes. For what, what yeah. time it is. Um, so okay. they're imminently to be published and okay. I said obviously the Home Secretary is, and his ministers have addressed this in detail okay. in the House previously. Could, two other things I just wanted to ask you very quickly. Do you agree that there is a moral case to support Lord Brown's amendment to the safety of Rwanda Bill to ensure that Afghans who helped our armed forces in Afghanistan are not sent to Rwanda? Yes or no? I, 
we, we have an existing scheme it's to working, bring... It's not working, though, is it? That's uh, the problem. Well, yes, it's brought thousands of people to the UK uh, under three different streams. Um, and we, obviously, in the interest of time, we don't need to go over them all here, but there's two different schemes, there's okay. multiple different strands, and we have brought thousands of people safely from Afghanistan okay. to the UK to provide them with uh, so the sanctuary. Highest, the and that contributes to our overall okay. numbers of around half a million people that we've welcomed to the UK through safe and legal okay. routes over so the, the past the highest, few years. So the highest group so within the small boats at the moment are from Afghanistan, aren't they, at 20%. So there is an issue about why those schemes are not working. My very final well, question... Well, I just think on, on that, that doesn't mean the schemes are not working. It might just mean that there are many more people who would like to come to this well, country than we have the resources and the capacity to safely look the after. And I think you can respect, see that. Prime Minister. I you don't can think see that's that. the view of most people looking at those schemes and uh, how slow they've been. But, no, I just no, I think, I, but I don't think you can infer from that just because people are coming, the scheme isn't working. There's a, well, there's a limit to how many people we okay. can take in this country, I'm, where we can house them and appropriately fund them. I, and uh, we just we heard specific, lots earlier so. from the from the from Clive about the pressures on local government. Yeah, Ultimately so much of the pressure from housing people falls on local government and that's why we do have to be cognizant my ca- of my the numbers. question was quite specific about the moral case for, for supporting those who'd who'd helped British forces in Afghanistan. Talking of moral cases, my very final question uh, I just wanted to, to ask you, you've already accepted the moral case uh, for compensation to be paid to the infected blood uh, victims, but I just want to ask you this, did your whips tell MPs last December that implementing Sir Brian Langstaff's infected blood compensation recommendations would actually mean no tax cuts would be in the budget? Is that what your MPs are told? I'm not. That's not something I'm aware of. But more generally, I'm acutely aware of the strength of feeling on this issue and the suffering of all of those impacted by what is an appalling <coughs> scandal. I've consistently acknowledge that justice should be delivered and we're working very hard to put things right. And that's why uh, the acceptance of moral case for compensation was made in October of 2022. And infected individuals and bereaved partners uh, registered with the scheme received interim payments um, at that time and that I've consistent I've provided evidence as well to the inquiry and the ministers have made uh, statements from the dispatch box about the things we're doing to provide psychological support services and appoint an expert group to advise the government on how to make informed choices in responding to the inquiry's report when we were So the answer it. is no to my question. You didn't tell your MPs that's, that. that's not something I'm familiar with at all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dame Diana. Uh, Joanna Cherry for the Human Rights Committee. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. If we can continue with questions about your Rwanda policy. The Joint Committee on Human Rights concluded that the Rwanda Bill does not comply with the UK's human rights obligations and that it would place the UK in breach of international law. And we observed that um, other nations might be influenced by the way in which the UK treats its international obligations. And we We pointed to the example of the interim Prime Minister of Pakistan, who has referred to the UK's Rwanda policy in defence of his country's decision to expel from Pakistan hundreds of thousands of Afghans who fled from the Taliban regime. Are you proud that he used your Rwanda policy to justify doing that? I'm obviously not responsible for the comments of uh, a person in another country, um, so I think that's a slightly bizarre thing to to say. But what I can say is I'm very confident that our Rwanda scheme is in compliance with all our international obligations, and we've worked very hard to ensure that that's the case. And in fact, the, the principle of sending people to Rwanda as a safe country was a principle that was supported um, by uh, by the High Court and and not challenged by the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court and in accordance with the Refugee Convention. So uh, I I said I'm very clear on what we're doing uh, and why what we're doing is right. Dame Diana mentioned that uh, there's evidence that quite a high number of people fleeing the Taliban regime are are reaching the United Kingdom's shore on small boats. Are you proud that your members of parliament were whipped against voting for an amendment that would have prevented Afghans who had aided or supported her Maj- His Majesty's armed forces in Afghanistan from being sent to Rwanda. Is that something that makes you proud? I, I, I really disagree with that characterisation. And given we've just had all these debates in Parliament about Opposition Day debates and what, the, what they do to MPs and intimidation, I actually think characterising like that is deeply unhelpful. 
No, well, we I have, have to, a parameter. I, I, I'll I answer the question. Say, but I, 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 I resent. I resent your characterisation. I'm asking you a perfectly reasonable question. You're, there you're are framing, people. There are people coming to our shores. You're, fra you're framing who have of the question. You've previously aided and abetted uh, okay, okay. You've our asked armed the forces the question, in Afghanistan, and, I would appreciate and you went to your MPs against an amendment which would have prevented them from being deported to Rwanda. I'm asking you whether you're proud of that policy. That's all I'm asking. Now hear from the Prime Minister. You've interrupted him twice. That we have, have a very clear obligation to make sure that we support those who aided us in Afghanistan, and we are delivering on that. We have multiple different schemes, which I've discussed in this committee in the past, three strands of them. Those schemes are operating and bringing thousands of Afghans safely to the UK in a way which is sustainable and where we can provide them with the appropriate support they need when they are here. And that is part of a broader approach that has welcomed half a million refugees to this country from varying different countries over the past several years. So we have a proud and compassionate record of making sure we support people who need that help. But it needs to be done in a legal way and it needs to be done in a way that is sustainable for local communities and for the individuals concerned so that we can provide them with the support that we need. And that's why we believe that our schemes, whether that's ARAP or ARCS, are the right way to do that. Other people will have their views, but we, we believe our way is the right way, and that's because we do believe we have an obligation and we're delivering on it. The Home Office uh, have prepared a 137-page long country information note on human rights in Rwanda, and it was recently updated in January, and it collates sources ranging from the US State Department to Human Rights Watch, which set out very grave shortcomings in the protection of human rights in Rwanda. Can you explain to me why it is that you feel able to ignore reliable information collated by your own Home Office in insisting that Rwanda is a safe country? Uh, because we have a new agreement with Rwanda that gives us the assurance that we need that people's rights will be respected and we're also supporting them to improve uh, the processing of people's claims. Uh, I would also make the point, as I've reiterated earlier, the High Court did find that it was generally safe for individuals to be relocated under the MEDP uh, in Rwanda, and, and that wasn't challenged by the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court. And the treaty that we now have makes further clear that all the obligations will be met of all individuals <coughs> and without discrimination. I also say the constitution of Rwanda includes a broad prohibition of discrimination. It does not criminalize or discriminate against uh, aspects that have been, um, been raised. And Rwanda itself is passing new laws on asylum processing. So for all those reasons, we are confident that this policy is the right one and is deliverable within all our obligations. And I've had commitments from the president down that they are absolutely determined to make this work. On that point, I think where you and I could agree is that the United Kingdom has some of the best human rights and equality protections in the world for people who are same-sex attracted or people who are transgender. But it's a matter of fact that there are no such laws in Rwanda. And indeed, the Foreign Office travel advice for Rwanda warns, and I quote, that individuals can experience discrimination and abuse, including from local authorities. There are no specific anti-discrimination laws that protect LGBT individuals. Why then do you think it would be safe to send LGBT asylum seekers to Rwanda? I guess I'll just refer to my previous answer. The constitution of Rwanda includes a broad prohibition of discrimination, and it doesn't criminalise or discriminate against sexual orientation in law or indeed in policy. Uh, we do have a legally binding treaty, uh, which makes clear that obligations will be met uh, in terms of treating people without discrimination as well. Um, but finally, the bill means that UK decision makers will always um, be able to consider compelling evidence relating specifically to an individual's particular circumstances um, whilst respecting the fact that our courts themselves have agreed with the government's view that Rwanda is generally safe for individuals relocated. Just very briefly on that, if Rwanda is as safe as you say and if you have no concerns about human rights protections in Rwanda notwithstanding the Home Office's concerns in what way do you expect the scheme to be a deterrent? Uh, because coming to the, it's not 
people will not be able to reside and remain in the UK. And what we've seen uh, from the situation with our Albanian deal is that once we have a functioning returns agreement, that means that we can return people who come here illegally back to uh, a different country, you see the arrivals drop, as they have done by over 90% from Albania. And if you look at how other countries, for example, Australia, uh, have dealt with this, it has also been found to work. That's why I'm confident that deterrence works. And I, I, without question, this is a, a novel thing to do. But we do need to look at novel and bold solutions to a situation which otherwise will just continue to get worse. Uh, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's fair. And I don't think that's compassionate. Because as we just saw weeks ago, people are tragically dying when they're exploited by gangs making these crossings. So for all sorts of reasons, the right thing to do is to break that cycle Having an effective deterrent is critical to that. Indeed, the National Crime Agency has also agreed that having a deterrent is key. Thank you, Joanna Cherry. And now we're moving into the um, global issues section of our session uh, with Kat Smith um, from the Petitions Committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, some of the most popular uh, e-petitions on the government website at the moment uh, regard the situation in Israel and Gaza. And following the UN Security Council's resolution to call for an immediate ceasefire, uh, what steps will the UK government be doing to ensure that that is implemented in terms of using economic and diplomatic levers? Yes, well, we were pleased to support the resolution at the UN because it uh, was consistent with our position, which is for a an immediate sustained humanitarian pause which would allow for the safe release of hostages, more aid into Gaza and provide the, um, I guess, a platform for a more lasting, durable ceasefire. Yeah, we will continue to do everything we can, both um, ask uh, and Israel at all levels to comply with international humanitarian law to improve the provision of humanitarian aid into Gaza, but also continue to call on Hamas and work with countries like Egypt and Qatar to unconditionally release the hostages. Um, does, the Prime Minister, does everything we can include looking at the situation of UK arms export licences? Uh, we have a very robust regime in place for export licences. There's a, a strategic export licensing criteria. We don't grant export licences where there's a clear risk. Um, that the items may be used to commit a serious violation of IHL, and that has been a long-standing case. And is that constantly under review? Uh, yes, uh, I've made that point clear from the dispatch box previously. So when we look at the situation in Gaza with more than 30,000 individuals um, being killed, 74,000 wounded, and when we look at children specifically, 13,000 uh, children have been killed and 17,000 have been orphaned, um, is that something that is taken into account when looking at the UK arms uh, licences? Yes, I mean you wouldn't expect me to comment in detail on, on legal assessments, but you can expect that all the things that you talked about will be things that we, regardless of the export license criteria, are things that are concerning. And I've repeatedly said the uh, this humanitarian situation in Gaza is awful. And we it's right that we do absolutely everything we can to alleviate the suffering of people. I'm pleased that actually just yesterday, the Royal Air Force airdropped for the first time 10 tonnes of food supplies into Gaza, working together with the Jordanians um, that has brought you know, water, rice, cooking oil, flour, canned goods, baby formula along the coastline. We've been working on that for a while. I talked about it at the dispatch box earlier. We want to get aid in through every route we can, land, air and sea. We've obviously done a lot by land. This is the first significant drop that we've done by air, which has been welcomed. Uh, and we are working with partners to improve aid access via the maritime corridor as well. And hopefully we'll have more to say on that um, in the coming days and weeks. Uh, but I, I don't disagree. The humanitarian situation is awful, <coughs> and I'm proud that we are doing everything we can to alleviate as much of that suffering as we can. So airdrops are the least effective way of delivering aid to, to any environment and is often seen as being the last resort by aid agencies. The most effective route is obviously by land crossings. And yeah. um, What representations are you making, Prime Minister, to the Israeli government to open the Rafah crossing? Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, we, of course we agree with that. What we need is many more trucks per day. I mean, the uh, pre-October 7th, there were 400 400 or 500 trucks a day going in, that's what's necessary, and now there are not that many, it's a fraction fewer, 100 to 200, uh, that's not good enough. I've made that point repeatedly to Prime Minister Netanyahu, as have our allies, and we will continue to press 
for more land access. That is the best way to get more aid in quickly. But whilst that is not happening at the scale we would like it, I do think it is right to do extra aid via other corridors, as I said. Those airdrops will still help, and the maritime corridor, when we get it up and running, will also help. Um, but you're right, the priority is to remove all the barriers to more land aid getting in uh, to Gaza. And aid is particularly short uh, of supply in northern Gaza, um, which is having real issues in terms of getting uh, supplies there. We have uh, documented cases now of uh, babies being born, but mothers being too weak to feed them, that they're dying of starvation in the first few hours of life. Um, is this collective punishment of people? Yeah, as I said, we, we, we would always and have consistently called on Israel to comply with all its obligations under inter international humanitarian law. We've already tripled uh, the aid or the humanitarian support that we are putting into the region and as they're doing it by every potential corridor. Uh, we are also uh, putting, um, I have, I've raised personally with Prime Minister Netanyahu the opportunity to bring more aid in from the north uh, through Ashdod port and then through the northern crossing at Karam Shalom. Uh, that is something together with allies we've continued to raise because that would open up more access into the north of Gaza as well. Mm -hmm. and, obviously and something that we've also in. talked about with the Jordanians mm -hmm. and again that I've discussed that with the King of Jordan himself because if we can get aid in through the top as I said by Karim Shalom, Ashdod, that will be helpful too. And, and getting aid in is only one part of the solution here, it's also about the distribution of aid and airdrops are often seen as being increasingly a survival of the fittest in terms of who's going to access uh, that aid. UNRWA are um, absolutely unmatched in their administrative ability to distribute aid, have an incredible track record on this. It's now been two months since the UK suspended support for UNRWA. At the time, um, the um, Secretary of State said in the House of Commons Chamber that he expected a decision to be made within two months. Given it's been two months, do you have an update? Yes. Uh, I think the first thing to say is we're absolutely appalled by the allegations of UNRWA staff being involved in the 7th of October attack. Um, we are committed to getting aid into Gaza. Um, our decision to pause funding to UNRWA hasn't had any impact on our overall uh, contribution to the humanitarian response. It's important that people know that. Um, so the UN's Office of Internal Oversight and author Catherine uh, Colonna have now provided their interim reports to the UN Secretary General. Uh, we want to hear from UNRWA detailed un un undertakings about the changes in personnel and policy, and we're talking consistently to allies about how to conclude all of that, um, because I don't disagree, UNRWA properly functioning does have a vital role to play in providing aid and services in Gaza, but it is right that we now reflect on the reports on governance that have been provided and work that through with allies, and that's what we're doing. And our, our position is consistent with, uh, as I said, many of our closest allies. Uh, and will the decision be in you. days or months? Just finally, um, are we expecting a decision in days or months? Uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't like to speculate. I mean, uh, hopefully not. Uh, we, we're all keen to get more aid in as quickly as possible, and that's what we're doing. But given the uh, appalling allegations, it's right that those are addressed seriously. A very brief follow-on on Gaza from thank, Stephen Thank Crabb. you, Chair. How is, how is, Prime Minister, how is a ceasefire resolution that contains not a word of condemnation of Hamas or any conditionality around hostage release consistent with our previous position and the language you've previously used about Hamas being so, evil and needing to see them militarily defeated? Yes, look, I, I can appreciate uh, concern on that point. I can very much appreciate that. And as I said, it, it, it is close to our position. It's not a perfect replication of it um, on Hamas in particular. And I think, as, as you know, I've been unequivocal and consistent in condemning Hamas and we will always do that. Um, on hostages though, you know, the way that I read the resolution and the way I think it should be read is that it does recall that the taking of hostages is obviously prohibited under international law and it also demands the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages and that was important. You know, this is not an unconditional ceasefire, this is a temporary pause, which is consistent with our position, alongside the, as I said, in the words of the resolution, immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, and as well as ensuring that more humanitarian access and aid can flow in. That has been, I think you'd agree, my consistent <coughs> position on this. And that's why I felt that the wording, and the Foreign Secretary felt that the wording was, that whilst not perfect, it, you know, close enough to our position that we should support it. I'm disappointed to see some reporting last night uh, that Hamas 
already saying that they're not engaging in conversations around hostage release, which tells you what the problem is. Um, you know, that it can't be right for hostages. No for them. It, it can't be right for hostages to be held like that, and it is reasonable for Israel to want to ensure its security and the safe return of its citizens, which is why we've always said this immediate temporary humanitarian pause needs to be accompanied by the unconditional release of the hostages so that we can then get more aid in. And unfortunately, um, you know, Hamas have, have not complied with that and they're the ones that are responsible and we should never lose sight of that. Uh, Liam Byrne for the Business and Trade Committee. Uh, thank you. Prime Minister, will the government now act to require ByteDance to divest itself of TikTok UK? Um, so we obviously have taken steps previously on TikTok on government devices, uh, which you'll be uh, familiar with, uh, but more generally, you know, we, we, we engage with TikTok and continue to do, and other companies, to make sure that we have a good understanding of the security of UK data, that it meets the high data protection and cyber security standards that we expect. We routinely do not comment on specific cases, but what I can say is that we continue to monitor any threats to our national security to UK data from all sources and would not hesitate to take appropriate steps to mitigate these if and when they arise. Would, would you allow TikTok on your children's phones? Uh, again, it's not really relevant for this conversation. CK Hutchinson, which is controlled by the Lee family and owns three, is seeking to merge with Vodafone. Will that deal now be blocked? Uh, again, it's the Competition and Markets Authority's responsibility to assess the impact on competition and consumers in the market. We don't have a, a role in the review of mergers. As you know, I think in January the CMA launched their formal investigation into the joint venture. They will publish their assessment um, about whether it requires a phase two review after, after that. Separately, we obviously have the National Security and Investment Act, uh, which I'm happy to talk to, which gives the government the powers as needed to um, to block or mod modify uh, investment transactions as we have done in previous cases. And will this deal be blocked? Uh, again, you would not expect me to comment on the use of those powers because uh, they're subject to a, a process, but we have not hesitated to use them where we thought it made sense, uh, particularly in the case of Newport Wafer Fab, uh, where we use powers under that act <coughs> to uh, order the divestment of that transaction. Xi'an, uh, the Chinese-backed fast fashion company, is exploring a float on the London Stock Exchange. The Chancellor met Donald Tang to encourage him. Will that float be allowed to proceed? Again, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on individual companies, um, so I, there's not much more I can uh, say to that. The EU has got an anti-subsidy probe, which it launched just before Christmas, into uh, electric vehicle imports from China. Uh, they asked us to join that investigation, and, and we said no. Why, why did we say no? Uh, I don't think that's quite right. We obviously have our own market monitoring uh, rules, and we have um, independent bodies that advise us, and we do our own work on that as well, something that I've discussed with the European uh, Commission President and I'm actually pleased that on the issue of electric vehicles uh, we were able to reach resolution on the issue of tariffs um, which would have uh, gone up on imports and exports between the EU and the UK on electric vehicles, something I think the committee called for us to resolve. But, but, but we refuse uh, to join an EU anti-subsidy investigation. Uh, but we, we always have the ability to conduct our own investigations as, as needed. Again, these are commercial things, you wouldn't expect me to comment on them. Okay. Well, our critical national infrastructure is full of Chinese cellular, cellular modules from companies like Quicktel, Fibercom, Sunsea and, and China Mobile. Uh, we're obviously acting to take out Huawei from some of the communications infrastructure. Will we now act to take out cellular modules from the network that controls the Internet of Things? I think the first thing to say is China represents the greatest state-based threat to our economic security. And as we've seen recently, we've seen behaviour that we just won't stand for. Their actions in relation to our and our allies' democracies are deeply concerning, which is why recently we've taken the retaliatory action and will continue to address their behaviour with tough action. We talked about Newport Wafer Fab, you talked about critical national infrastructure. It's worth bearing in mind that I took the decision to ensure that Chinese state-owned nuclear energy company will no longer be a part of the Sizewell C project, mm -hmm. and we previously, the government, took the decision to remove Huawei kit from UK 5G networks. There's a host of other things that we're also doing uh, to protect ourselves. 
Um, and all I'd say is that wh where we identify risks and threats, the track record is clear that we will take action. Okay, so we're about to join CPTPP. Uh, China has said that it wants to join. If China seeks to join, once we're a member, will we block that application? Again, that wouldn't be an appropriate thing uh, to say, but what's crystal clear is uh, everyone who joins CPTPP needs to meet very high standards. Uh, that was a condition of our joining. We work very hard to meet those standards. I know it's uh, something that is shared by our allies in the CPTPP partnership, and that is a block of people who maintain a similar set of very high standards, whoever they are, that wishing to join that block would need to agree to the same standards. So that was six clear case studies, and we haven't had a, an unambiguous answer for any, any single one of those six case studies. Now, the US House of Representatives, as you know, has passed legislation now to require ByteDance to divest itself of TikTok. Um, C.K. Hutchinson's leaders are deeply connected to the political structure in China. Uh, Congress has also flagged profound concerns about the use of forced labor in Xi'an supply chain. We've taken out Huawei, but we've still got lots of Chinese kit in cellular modules. The business secretary does actually have the power to initiate an investigation by the Trade Remedy Authority to investigate subsidies. Uh, in the Chinese EV industry. It just feels that where our allies are actually acting, we are just thinking about it. I think that's completely and utterly wrong, and it's just not borne out by any of the evidence. Well, I've just given so you our, six so case our, studies. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to respond to all of those. So uh, our approach to China is undoubtedly more robust than, I'd say, most of our allies, in fact. Actually, the language we use is very similar if you look at across all our foreign policy strategies. Um, but it, you, you talked about Huawei. There are European countries, including Germany, when I last checked, that have not removed Huawei kit from their telecoms infrastructure. We placed export controls on sensitive technologies to China uh, last year. Again, they haven't been replicated by the EU and in some cases are broader than those in the US. Our foreign investment regime that we passed is the most recent version of that law out of any of our allies and as a result is more robust probably than what you find in any European country, well, including let me, let me, in the like US. And let, me just, let me just finish. And then on trade, we were already less dependent on China for trade than Australia, Korea, Japan, the US, Germany, and many other countries. Um, and then lastly, I don't think any other country has set up a National Protective Security Agency, which we have funded, uh, dealt with by MI5, which means that we can provide specific support to companies to manage the threats from all states when it comes to uh, IP theft or an espionage. So I'm entirely confident that our approach to dealing with the risk that China poses is, uh, is very much in line with our allies and in most cases goes further in protecting ourselves. It thank clearly you. doesn't, but thank you, Sir Bernard. In a word, Prime Minister, does the Chinese economy qualify as a market economy? Uh, well, I mean, obviously, it's not run in the same way as we would run our economy. And I've so always been no. very clear, it represents the greatest state-based threat to our economic security. Thank you. Uh, and it's a country with fundamentally different values to ours. It's behaving increasingly assertive abroad, authoritarian at home. That is a source of concern. But the track record, particularly over the last few years, is one where we have taken significant measures to protect ourselves. I, 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 I take that to be... Size well, export license controls, all the rest. I, I take going. that to be a no in that case. Um, moving on to Sir Jeremy Quinn, and I should just say the context is very much Ukraine in our minds, which we lay emphasis on in every session though we're not asking specifics this, this time, except that last time you did say that a success for Russia and Ukraine was an existential threat to European and transatlantic <coughs> security. We take that as red. Jeremy Quinn for the Defence Committee. Thank you, Sir Bernard. And it flows naturally from that. Uh, clearly, uh, the invasion of uh, Ukraine has had implications uh, for all of us. The armed forces get asked to do a great deal. They do it. Uh, incredibly well. However, my committee's recent uh, report highlighted serious concerns in the event of a war with a peer adversary, including on stockpiles, on resupply, on personnel and training. We need to be ready to deter. Are those concerns that you recognise? Uh, no, I, I believe that we are investing in our defences. Uh, if you look at the uh, track record over the last few years, I, as Chancellor, approved the largest uplift in defence spending since the end of the Cold War, £24 billion. Subsequent to that, 
at different events have announced something like £10 billion extra over the next few years, particularly focused on stockpiles, as you rightly mentioned, as an area of focus, also strengthening our nuclear enterprise, which yesterday's announcement, uh, which we made when I was in Barrow, uh, further does. And we remain you know, the second largest defence spender not just now, but over the past decade in NATO and everywhere I go and the other leaders I talk to, they have nothing but respect and admiration for our armed forces, are keen to do more with us, learn from us, and that's why we've strengthened our uh, military alliances, defence alliances with countries like Japan, like South Korea uh, and others. Absolutely, take the point that we are investing, but clearly a lot has happened since 2020, including uh, Ukraine, to which the chair uh, referred. Uh, the Defence Secretary has referred to us uh, entering into a pre-war world. Against that backdrop, when do we expect to be hitting our 2.5% ambition? We've said we will do that when the conditions allow, but it's worth saying that defence spending is already on an upward trajectory and we're already due to hit 2.3% uh, of GDP on defence spending. And it's also important to, to recognise that you know, investments in supporting Ukraine are also investment in our security. I think the chair made the point at the beginning that, that collective security in the Atlantic is indivisible. Ukraine security is our security. Uh, and Russia's forces being degraded ultimately is, a, is to a benefit for us. Um, you know, what I would say is that the last year or so has made it clear that there is work to be done on defence industrial production, and that's not a UK only uh, concern, that's one concern uh, shared by all our allies across Europe and, and NATO, uh, which is why we have put specifically more money into munitions, into long-term contracts for things like whether it's N-Laws or Starstreak missiles or 155mm ammunition, which there's been lots of commentary on. Um, and I think that has, you know, what the last year or so has you know, showed that we need to collectively up our game when it comes to defence industrial production. We're making the investments, we're signing the contracts, and I think we can look forward to a very significant increase in, in the coming months and years. And I agree with that, Prime Minister, but we really need to. So at the moment, Russia is outgunning uh, Ukraine five to one in terms of expenditure of shells. Um, there's recent reports by CNN about how substantially Russia is uh, producing munitions uh, mm. in excess of what uh, uh, the US and Europe are doing. And with 40% of all Russian government expenditure going on to uh, their military with the hot war in Europe with increasing challenges, as we've discussed, from China and Iran, uh, I know you said earlier to this committee, quite reasonably, the government is about uh, prioritisation, but would you accept that there is a point where we can't afford not to invest more in our national defence? You know, I, I agree with that, and that's why we are and we have prioritised it. And yesterday's announcement, again, further evidence of our commitment to our security and making sure that the resilience of our nuclear enterprise is safeguarded for, for years to come. Uh, but, but munitions is a particular issue, and you're right to highlight Russian production. That's why you know, we announced in February that we were going to invest almost £250 million to reinvigorate uh, supply chains. And also, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced another £300 million for cutting-edge drones to fight Putin's invasion. It's why my first trip of this year was to Ukraine. Very deliberately, I was the first foreign leader to be there. We were the first major country to announce our financial support for this year, which has increased versus the last two years. So that's a sign of my commitment and my prioritisation. But we can't do this alone. And it's all very well us spending what we're spending on defence. It's all very well us uh, providing support to the Ukrainians. Well, we need allies to do the same. That is the only way collectively to give them the the help that they need. I'm pleased that we've demonstrated leadership in that, and that was recognised by President Zelensky when I was there. He was grateful for us to do it, and that has helped catalyse other announcements from other countries, and that's been the track record when it comes to Ukraine. First country to provide lethal aid, first country to provide main battle tanks, first country to provide long-range weapons. Ultimately, all those things were emulated by others, which has benefited our collective security. But you know, we are leading. I'm proud of our role, but we need everyone else to step up to. Thank you for that, Prime Minister. I would have liked to have heard a date on 2.5, we will, perhaps more, we will persist on that. But by way of a last question, uh, you just mentioned the announcement on nuclear uh, yesterday, that followed a very positive announcement on AUKUS uh, last week. 
but we need an awful lot. We need more nuclear PhDs, more nuclear apprentices. There's the investment in Barrow. There's the uh, work to be done on our transport infrastructure. The list goes on. How are you inst going to institutionalise a cross-government effort to ensure that we can actually generate that national endeavour that we need to do to get where we need to be. Uh, all the things that you mentioned are things that were covered by the announcement yesterday, mm. doubling the number of apprenticeships, graduates, PhDs, because um, you're right, we need all of those, and investing £200 million in the long-term transformation of Barrow, so it's a fantastic place uh, to live, work, raise a family. Um, they do an enormous and important job for us, everybody there. We owe them a debt of gratitude, and it's right that we're supporting them. Uh, I've been sharing specific uh, NSC meetings focused on this over the, since I became Prime Minister. We have strengthened the nuclear <coughs> enterprise, not just with funding, but with better governance, and we have made it a proper national endeavour, and you can expect that we'll put the governance in place to ensure the delivery of that. Uh, there's a fantastic SRO in, in Maddy, who you'll, who you'll know, um, who's doing an excellent job, uh, and I think it's now getting the attention and focus that it deserves and needs to ensure we can deliver on the, the task ahead. So it's NSC-led, and it flows from there, you've actually got the grip at the centre. Yes, and it has coordinated all the different aspects, whether that's MHCLG for Barrow, Desnes on the civil nuclear side, and obviously the defence aspects as well. And we've brought it all together, uh, and I've spent quite a bit of time on it over the past year. Thank you. Jeremy. I'm tempted to ask will you, what consideration you're giving to putting 2.5% of GDP for defence in the manifesto like the triple lock? <laughs> well, I think we'll try not to write too much of the manifesto in the here and now. So. <laughs> I think I've made my point. Um, um, we'll, we're coming on to the scrutiny of strategic thinking in government, um, but first of all we'll have uh, William Rank. Uh, thank the you. Public Very administration. Um, Sir Bernard, I'm, I'm grateful. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Afternoon. Don't worry, we're nearly there. Now, um, Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman has got a degree of topicality in the last week or so, given the recommendation on women's state pension age. May I ask you briefly, do you have a time scale for the government's response on that report? Uh, no, I, I don't. It's, as you know, a detailed report um, uh, concerns issues that date back uh, some, yeah. some years as well. Uh, and obviously, as we've said, we'll go through it thoroughly as we've started and respond in due course. Thank you. Um, on the same theme of the Ombudsman, though, um, the current Ombudsman's role, the, he, he retires from his role at the end of this month. Last night in the House, a motion was put for the appointment of a temporary Ombudsman. I sat on a panel uh, that put forward a name to number 10 for the permanent position. Uh, what's the status of that name? I'll have to get back to you, I'm afraid, Will, so I, I apologise. <laughs> so. I, I, I would be grateful because the panel wrote to you in mid-January um, on, on this matter, and it is important. If I could move on to civil service reform. Um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has announced in the Autumn Statement that the civil service will be capped at 488,000 and it's continued to grow though and it's currently on 502,750. Uh, is the government's policy still to reduce the size of the civil service? Uh, I mean, yes, I alluded earlier to efficiency savings. I mean, I'm not going to... Obviously, what, what the Chancellor said is the, is the statement of, of policy, but mm. more broadly, I just refer back to the earlier comments that what we'd seen is a we've seen a five percent decline in public sector productivity since before the pandemic that's worth 20 billion pounds i think everyone should be focused on recovering pre-pandemic productivity unlocking that money to reinvest in public services that's good for the taxpayer good for public services delivery and uk citizens obviously headcount is a um, is one of the features of productivity, uh, but as a general rule, we should be striving for greater public sector productivity. Uh, do you but the Chancellor has been driving uh, this process. Yeah. Do you have a figure for that um, headcount that you'd like to see? Uh, I have said I, I've only got the, the overall public sector productivity <coughs> number is 5%, it's worth okay. about £20 billion. Pounds. I haven't got the headcount numbers to hand, so but I just refer you to whatever the Chancellor said on the matter, because yeah. he's giving it very close attention. Thank you. Um, what's your response to Lord Maud's recommendation that the Cabinet Secretary and the Head of the Civil Service roles be separated? Uh, you know, I, uh, I think we're still in the process, and I'm certainly in the process, of digesting all of his various recommendations and will respond, no doubt, at the appropriate time. I think there are some things that we're already doing, which I'm sure we'll touch on in terms of things like training and other bits and bobs, but I, I can't recall every single recommendation to hand. Yeah. Now, last year, when I asked you about your views of characterisations of the civil service as a blob, uh, resisting government policy, you, you stressed your faith in the, the competency and the integrity of the civil 
servants that you've, you've worked with. Uh, that's, that's still the case. Yes, uh, very, very much so, and particularly as Prime Minister, as it was as Chancellor, the support I receive on a daily basis in then number 11 in the Treasury and now number 10 is superb, and I'm very grateful for it. What are your thoughts or comments on your predecessor when she uh, says she was undermined by, quotes, the, the deep state? Yeah, I think that's probably a question for her rather than me. But I'm just keen, keen to hear your view, Prime Minister. Is, Sorry? is, there, is there a deep state? Or are you part of it? Am I part of it? <laughs> yeah, probably a question for her. <laughs> no, I, pro I probably wouldn't tell you if I was, well, would I? No, no, no. no and, and, I would, I would, and, I, <laughs> and we we wouldn't tell anyone else no, either. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anybody else either, Sir Bernard, if I was. So it's not just a case of perhaps a, a few chaps getting you know overly excited after a good lunch, say, at the Garrick, is it? Said. <laughs> Question for her. <laughs> okay, so well, well, one nice lunch venue to another, Prime Minister. The, the House of Lords. Um, now, the House of Lords Appointments Commission has traditionally had the power to recommend uh, non party political candidates to appointment to the House of Lords, i.e., cross benches. Uh, but Holak's not been able to make any recommendations since 2022. Are you going to allow Holak to recommend new cross bench peers in this Parliament? Uh, I. I am um, not sure that they haven't, so I'll happily look into that. I didn't have any particular aversion yeah. to it in they, the past, they, they, and my thought was that I, we had, so... Okay, they're, they're entitled, I think, a few each year. Perhaps, yes, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any particular issue uh, with that. Obviously, we have to decide the right time and alongside everything else to make final decisions, but I don't have a, a principled objection to it, um, but I will happily take that away. On that in issue of principle and further House of Lords appointments, are there any circumstances in which you would appoint an individual to the House of Lords against Holak's advice on the propriety of that appointment? I think, I think we talked about this last time uh, I was here. That is, that is not, it's not what I have done and not what I would in, intend to do. I mean, constitutionally and legally, of course, as you know, it's for the Prime Minister to make recommendation to the Sovereign on peers and OLAC is a advisory, non-departmental public body. Um, I think it's the right thing. Uh, but uh, I, I, certainly that is the advice I've always followed hitherto. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Rag. Um, we're now moving on to... I, I, I hope it's all right if we borrow a little more of your time, because we've, we've slightly extended. Uh, it's just uh, two of us to go. Uh, the... Um, uh, the the subcommittee of the liaison committee is running this inquiry into the scrutiny of strategic thinking in government. And Sir Jeremy touched on one of the very big strategic decisions you've made about how to manage the cross-departmental program of the whole nuclear enterprise spanning civil and military. And there are other big decisions you've made, such as on energy and HS2, um, uh, which reflect um, big strategic decisions reflecting deep strategic thinking. What were the processes that led to these decisions and are you satisfied with them and can they be, as, as Sir Jeremy suggested, better institutionalised across government so that we see more of this kind of strategic thinking? Um, uh, well, well uh, thank you for that, Sir Bernard. I, I don't think there was any particular process that led to those compared to just being examples of things that I was keen to do. I, what joins them is their focus on the long term and I put a few other things in there like um, to the long term workforce plan that uh, Steve raised earlier is not something that's been done before probably because most people think well they won't be around <laughs> in 13 years when those consultants that they're paying for uh, to be trained will actually end up benefiting anybody. Um, so, But where I've, I've always tried to focus on the long term and what I think is right for the long term of the country is whether that's HS2, a different approach to net zero, long term workforce plan, what we're doing on, on smoking and vaping. I think all of them are examples of that longer term thinking, uh, which is a good thing. It's not always easy to do in government, but um, I think it's the right thing to do and as best as possible, trying to get people to focus on the long term is obviously a good thing. What do you think we learn from vital cross-departmental strategic leads such as contest or the vaccine task force that we could use in other areas yes i i think some of these things vaccine task force in particular one of the learnings is probably the the benefit of having people from outside government come in i think it's obviously very valuable i'm not sure how 
repeatable or replicable the situation that the vaccine task force was designed to deal with is in in ordinary course of business um, but i think certainly having external people come in to fo focus on something uh, was valuable we have replicated to some extent that model for the ai task force um, which is slightly distinct from government we've been lucky to attract superb people like ian hogarth um, from industry uh, and they've done an excellent job globally respected around the world particularly in the US um, where they're very keen to learn from us and again it has a very tightly defined specific mandate it's doing its thing it's got delegated budgets that's worked quite well ARIA is another example of that uh, and so I think those are the models which where we try to replicate the vaccine task force model in as I said in research at ARIA and in the AI task force where it has worked but those are quite specific areas. Contest? Uh, probably, uh, probably the same. Again, uh, given the importance of the issue, I think there's, I think people realise, like the vaccine, there are certain issues which, because of their salience, probably attract the right amount of attention just by virtue of that. Well, what about net zero? Philip Dunn. Uh, thank you, Sir Bernard. Uh, Prime Minister, you just mentioned uh, net zero in response to Sir Bernard. That, to my mind, I think is widely recognised to be uh, the, the largest strategic endeavour of government as we seek to decarbonise the whole economy, the biggest thing that we've done since the Industrial Revolution. Multi-decades, uh, massive cross-party strategic programme. How important do you see political consensus in order to uh, achieve such a big stra strategic shift across the country? Yeah, I think it is important because I think if you don't carry people with you, uh, what you will do is ultimately turn people off the whole idea entirely, which would be uh, bad. I personally think. I think we all. You know, I have two young girls. Want to make sure we leave them the environment in a better state than we found it. But we've got to do that in a pragmatic and a proportionate, and realistic way. As I said, otherwise people will turn off the whole idea. And I obviously made a speech and adjusted our policy on this um, uh, last year. Uh, I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, one of the areas that. I highlighted was the fact that we've got an incredible track record. We've decarbonised faster than pretty much every other major economy. Uh, because of that, we can have confidence in our targets and our plan, and we can do things in a way that eases the burden on families, saving them five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds. Still hit our obligations, which are more ambitious, as I said, than any other country, um, and, and that's the right approach. And I think the other thing, which I know you've been in correspondence with the Secretary of State on, rightly, is around, I'd say, the scrutiny that happens when we set these carbon budgets. And Can I, think I come on to that in a fine. Well, that's an you're, important you're part of me. answer all my questions in one answer. Fine. I've got three, so Sorry. I'd like to be able to pose. Um, so you, you touched on your, your speech. Now, some of you characterised it as a pragmatic response to delivery the pro, of the programme. Some commentators have seen it as an attempt to introduce a sort of partisan dimension to undermine the consensus that we've already got. How would you address that criticism? I'd say our track record is clear. We've decarbonised faster than any other country. Our targets for the future are also more ambitious. So we can feel, A, very proud of what we're doing. This is not about watering down any targets. But I inherited plans which would have cost families five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds to prematurely be changing equipment in their houses or switching out their cars before other countries were doing any of these things, installing expensive upgrades, changing diets or other things. I didn't think any of that was necessary or appropriate. Uh, and so we changed it. Um, but we are still going to hit our targets. We're still going to be better than pretty much every other country in the world at this. But we're going to do so in a way that recognises the cost on ordinary families. And I think that is the right approach. If it's partisan, so be it. If other people want to say, no, no, we should rush headlong into this thing with no regard to the costs, and we have to get there faster than anyone else, even though we only account for 1% of emissions, then I'll let them make the argument. Um, and that's fair enough. And I understand other political parties have said that. But that's for them to justify. I think my approach, our approach, is the proportion of pragmatic, realistic approach, which will get us there, but command broad support as we do, which is important. Thank you. In your speech, as you've just said, you also touched on parliamentary scrutiny, and you're right, we've been engaged with the Secretary of State, and I'm very pleased to have received a constructive response from the Secretary of State uh, for Desnes this morning, ahead of this hearing, uh, confirming many of the ideas that we put forward for improving parliamentary scrutiny above the 17 minutes for the mm. sixth carbon budget, which you pointed out in your speech in September. Um, so do you, I, I take it from that response that you endorse the idea that Parliament needs to get involved 
in the uh, passage for the seventh carbon budget, which covers the years 2038 to 2042, in order to ensure that both the ambition and the methodology, the path to get yeah. there, is properly scrutinised by Parliament. Yes. Uh, can I say thank you to you and your committee for the recommendations and suggestions. You would have seen the Secretary of State has uh, very much agreed with the sentiment of what you're saying. I won't get into the specific line by line, but the fundamental point is, as you mentioned, last time we put in place legally binding targets on carbon reduction in this country with far-reaching impacts on people, the economy, society, it was debated for 17 minutes and Parliament. It was voted through without any thought to what actually would be required to deliver those. I don't think that's right. And that's what we will change in the future. Your suggestions uh, are very helpful in us formulating the right way to do that. But it's clear that when we discuss the next Carbon Budget 7, at the same time everyone says, yes, we want to reduce carbon emissions, they're very clear about what that means. And we should all be clear-eyed about what it means. We shouldn't just wish and will the ends without having a conversation about the means. And thanks to your engagement, I think next time around our country and Parliament does this, we will be even better off for it. Thank you, Prime Minister. One final very quick question, Sir Bernard. So yesterday there was another announcement by your DEFRA Secretary that the sustainable farming incentive should be uh, limited to encourage food production. Mm. Does this reflect a recognition that food security is a public good? Yes, and I made that point uh, at the LFU conference when I spoke there. Uh, we need to increase British food production. Uh, we can do that, and that's why we want to make sure that our farming schemes incentivise that. Of course, we want to protect the environment, but we can't forget that the primary purpose of farming is to produce food. And so, that, so that is a message that you can send out to the tractor drivers that were surrounding Westminster yesterday? Uh, yes, and uh, I said I've had very good conversations with many farmers at the NFU conference and later in Wales when I was there the week after that. The, the, the reforms that the Secretary of State set out earlier as well are all geared to increasing food security and food production in the UK. Um, uh, that's what we need to do. There's lots of opportunities to do that. We need to make sure we protect agricultural use for that purpose, uh, and that is again what the latest set of announcements continue to do. Thank you, Sir. Prime Minister, thank you. And we've had a lot of evidence suggesting that in order to embed um, a strategic culture in Whitehall so that ministers get much better comprehensive strategic advice from civil servants, that we would need to re establish um, a national school for government of some kind uh, in order to teach strategic thinking and strategic decision making and to help change the culture. How much do you agree with your two predecessors that this should actually be done? Yes, I, I am, I'm actually open to the idea. Um, sorry, but it's just, when you talk about the physical location or just the general principle, well, it, um, uh, both? No other major civil service around the world does not have a physical location yes. for, for teaching so, face to face, online, using online and yeah. contractors. But it's not the same. Not no, work. so look, I, I'm broadly supportive of that. And actually, when part of when I was contemplating how to put the Treasury campus or the economic campus in Darlington, you know, was thinking about whether you could incorporate something like that into that uh, facility at the same time. I'm obviously very sympathetic to that question for resourcing and the next spending review. But again, on a point of principle, very much welcome to hearing committee's recommendations uh, on that, so that can be picked up in the next spending review. But I think it's a you know, eminently sensible and plausible idea. Tempted to make another manifesto request. But um, could um, ministers and potential ministers, unlike almost any other profession, uh, we have very little ongoing professional development and training. Would it be a good idea if this institution was set up to train ministers and would-be ministers and would-be special advisors in the same way so that uh, everyone understands the same language? Yeah. Well, I think there is already... A, an established training program for ministers that it's worth just remarking on. I think there are eight different training courses involved in it. Um, those courses are open to all ministers and on top of that the uh, Infrastructure and Projects Authority, the IPA, runs some very specific training for ministers who are dealing with major, sponsoring major projects. Um, so that, that, that's there and there's also an induction program now that didn't exist for new ministers. This was also picked up I think in some of the Francis Maud uh, recommendations. So no, I, I think it's it's very open to considering whether we have the right mechanisms in place. But it is worth just reflecting that there are there, uh, people think there is nothing. There are actually various training modules that are in place and are being used. 
And um, finally, um, it's widely understood that um, younger generations feel very disengaged from politics. Um, they don't feel engaged in the strategic questions that will affect their futures. What do you think Parliament could do to address this? And how much would you uh, consider following the example of Finland, for example, and having a, a futures committee or a future generations committee that engages with the government on these long-term questions, such as, as the Cabinet Secretary asked, who is asking the questions about what our demographics will be like in mm. 30 years' time, and who is asking those questions and suggesting that really Parliament should be resourced to ask those questions? Well, intergenerational fairness is obviously vitally um, important. That's why we're talking about trying to consider the long-term implications of policies. Actually, Harriet's first question was all about debt, and that ultimately is an intergenerational question, right? Every pound that we're borrowed, borrowing today is ultimately, you know, high taxes for our kids and our grandkids that they'll have to, to pay back. So making sure that you do reduce the debt burden over time is an important part of ensuring that intergenerational uh, fairness. I, I haven't thought through that specific thing, Bernard. I mean, I, I think legislative mechanisms are I'm probably, I'm not sure about whether that would quite do what you're wanting it to do. Obviously, resourcing of committees and things is a question for Parliament. Uh, not the government, um, but I, I don't disagree that we need to focus on intergenerational fairness as a as a point. I think that is important. Well, the select committees wouldn't exist if Margaret Thatcher hadn't had that in her manifesto, um, and um, uh, it, uh, it is for government to propose that the leader of the house to propose that the House of Commons should have those resources. But that's me making my point. I have no further questions. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Prime Minister, and um, we wish you and your family a good Easter break. And the same to all of you. Thank you very much. Order, order.